And we are once again entering into uncharted territory with this uh, coming week. Starting today, I think. You know, I, uh, a few years ago, I said this. I said, I've said it many times before that I don't really like to speak about politics from the pulpit, but over increasingly the past four years, I've had to do that. And uh, I'm glad that our liberal religious tradition allows for freedom of the pulpit so that whoever is in the pulpit can speak freely without fear of reprisal. Dr. King once said, as I said back then, he said, if I wish to compose or write or pray or preach well, I must be angry. That almost sounds like a, an odd thing to say about someone who's gonna preach a sermon. But he says, I must be angry. Then all the blood in my veins is stirred and my understanding is sharpened. And I'm not Dr. King. I'm not anything close to Dr. King, but like many of you, I'm angry. I believe that democracy such as we've all lived with in the past few years, the past four years is in danger. And I think though that in a three days or so, things will change after that. But I'm not sure what's going to happen. And I'm going to confess something right now. I printed out the wrong sermon but I remember what I was going to say. There's some of it here. I think that democracy has been experiencing a slow, painful death over the past four years under the Trump administration. And I don't say that as hyperbole. I don't say that as an over the top statement to get attention. Yet there are still some people out there not here, I don't believe, but there are people out there who might say to you or they say to me, come on, it's not that bad. It's not the end yet. Yes, things are a little out of control, but you know, things, things are going to be okay. You know, saying something like that is like watching a blindfolded person run to, um, toward a cliff. We know they're going to go off. We know they're going to run off the cliff. And we don't do anything to stop them. And to ignore that, not to shout, stop running, take the blindfold off and stop running to that person makes us responsible for whatever happens to that person. And over the past four years, and especially since the election in November, we've been watching as democracy in America is merely racing towards the edge of a, not, not just racing toward the edge of a cliff, but it is being shoved off the cliff by a narcissistic, petty bigot and his cronies in Congress and his appointees. We've watched as he has duped millions of people into believing that he alone can save America, that he alone has the ability to make America great again. We've seen him and his, his cult members, and I, I use that term cult members very thoughtfully, because really that's what's happened. It's developed into a cult, a cult of personality. There's no denying that. We've seen him and his cult members embrace the wildest conspiracy theories that you can think about, about his opponents. Uh, you've heard some of them, that there was a, a, uh, a pedophile child uh, pornography ring being run out of a, the basement of a pizza parlor by Hillary Clinton. Who comes up with this stuff? More than that, who believes that kind of stuff? Or that there are people 
I'm not, I'm telling the truth there. There are people, lizard people, aliens in Congress right now plotting to overthrow the United States government. And he pushes these things. They believe things about the election process. They believe things certainly about the uh, November election that simply are not true, that have been disproven over and over and over again. But let me say this, it's not just the uneducated, out of work white people in middle America who believed him and who voted for him again. I've met, and maybe you have too many highly educated people who uh, did the same thing. People that we're surprised and we say, you believe him? You voted for him? Maybe people in your family or neighbors. And let's not forget that the media has given him an awful lot of free airtime, not only before he was elected, but during this past four years. And no matter what they say, he's still getting the airtime and he loves it. That's the nature of narcissism. We've heard ad nauseum about the wall, about the problem of immigrants and throwing kids in cages, about the lying media and lying Hillary, lying all of these people, and about his plan to create a, a registry for Muslims in America. <coughs> We've seen his support of autocratic, autocratic rulers and dictators around the world. And we've seen how he handles the press when he speaks to them, especially women, and in particular, women of color who challenge him and who ask him tough questions, questions that he doesn't want to answer. Based on his choice of vice president and his appointment of warmongers and bank and Wall Street executives and climate change deniers and white supremacists, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that we've been headed and being pushed toward the brink for the past four years. And my tendency, if you've ever seen me watch TV with the news on, my tendency is to go right to anger. Anger is a very valid emotion at times. You know, we have that, that hymn in our hymnal, the title of today's sermon, a gentle, angry people. Anger and gentleness are not always mutually exclusive. Dr. King said that there is a place for anger and ranting if it's directed into positive action. That's just what he did in his work and in the struggle for civil rights. It's what he was talking about when he wrote the letter to the Birmingham jail, letter from a Birmingham jail, I'm sorry, to the white Christian and Jewish leaders who were saying that he was an outside agitator come down there to Birmingham who would do more harm than good and that he should stop his call for direct, direct action and civil disobedience. And in that well-known paragraph in that letter, he wrote this, he said, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the eighth century BC left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. He said, like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Paul had a vision. He's referring there to a vision that Paul had about someone in the, the country of Macedonia calling for him to come there to teach them the gospel. And he goes on, he says, moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. That's something that we don't see very much from Donald Trump or his supporters and, and enablers in Congress these days. Let me repeat that. He says, moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. 
Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its boundaries. Dr. King understood the deep and the inescapable connection between spirituality and commitment to social justice. He understood what the prophets, the Hebrew prophets said, what they were doing and talking about when they spoke boldly against the injustice, not only of the foreign oppressors that the Jews lived under for so long, but against the injustice and evils perpetrated by the Hebrew kings and leaders who oppressed their own people. In his I Have a Dream speech, he quotes from the often forgotten small book of the Bible, one of the prophets, the prophet Amos. But the specific quote that he uses comes from Amos chapter 5, verse 24, which says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And But here's that quote in context. And this is God speaking through the prophet Amos to the people of Israel, to the leaders of Israel. He says, I hate I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace off I will not accept them, and the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, to the, me the melodies of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In that context there, we see that the Hebrew, the God that the Hebrews work, uh, worshiped, Yahweh, said, this is all garbage to me, what you're doing, because it's not true. If you don't have justice, you don't have the right to offer me those other things. And Amos, like the other Hebrew prophets, were speaking to a nation and its leaders in very similar circumstances to ours. At the time Amos was speaking, Israel was actually doing very well. It was prospering, mostly because the other nations were finally leaving them alone. But that prosperity wasn't benefiting everyone. In fact, the rich were getting very rich off of the labor of the poor, and the poor were getting poorer as the rich leaders increased the taxes on them. The religious leaders of the day were a bunch of self-satisfying hypocrites who placed heavy burdens on the people, burdens that cost money and increased their own wealth. The rich prospered and the poor suffered. The religious elite, they were pious and faithful to their own piety, but the poor were ostracized from the temple because they didn't have the money to go. They couldn't offer the sacrifice. They couldn't afford the sacrifice. The religious elite and the politicians, they were the cohorts who worked with and mutually benefited each other. They were part of that same corrupt system. And that should sound familiar to us today. Nationalism and white Christianity have had a long, cozy relationship in American history. And over the past century, and especially during the times of war and civil unrest, we've seen that the rise of a nationalist faith isn't all that different from the nationalist faith that rose in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. And now we're also faced with the challenge of Amos and the prophets. We're faced with the challenge that many people and religious leaders in Germany and Europe faced when the Nazis took power. People like Cory Ten Boom and her family who lived in Amsterdam during the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. They were very devout members of the Dutch Reformed Church who hid Jews in the walls and the basement of her family's watch and clock repair shop in Amsterdam. And eventually they were caught, her and her family, and they were sent to concentration camps. She was the only survivor from her family. Or there's a German Lutheran minister, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote that we are not to simply bandage the wounds of victims beneath the wheels of injustice, 
we are to drive a spoke into the wheel itself. Bonhoeffer was a key figure in what became known as the Confessing Church, a group of anti-Nazi dissidents. They were members and clergy in the German Protestant Church who opposed the Nazi attempts to take over the church. And the, the spoke that Bonhoeffer spoke about and his colleagues came to believe that they had to drive into the wheel of Nazi injustice was an attempted assassination on Adolf Hitler, which ultimately failed. In the face of Nazi atrocities, the full scale of which Bonhoeffer learned through other dissidents, he concluded that the ultimate question for a responsible man to ask is not how to extricate himself heroically from the affair, but how the coming generations shall continue to live. He was arrested and executed with all the other plotters and he was only 39 years old. And yet still today, some people are saying, you're comparing what's happening here to what hap happened in Germany. You're comparing what Donald Trump and his cronies are doing and, and have done to what the Nazis did. Do you really believe that that can happen here? And my response is that that's what so many in Germany and other parts of Europe, Europe said at that time. And they ignored it. What many American leaders even said and ignored. Remember that it wasn't so long ago, five years ago when he first declared that he would run for president that he'd never be elected. He was a joke. Donald Trump, I forget who it was. I saw the other, they were playing stuff from the other, uh, a few years ago. And one prominent um, uh, commentator said, Donald Trump will never be elected president. And they laughed at him. And yet he was, despite the fact that he lost the popular vote by over 3 million or perhaps more. So yes, I do believe it can happen here again. And this is why Martin Luther King Day is so meaningful to us. The meaning of the work, the work that Martin Luther King did and so many others did, their struggle and their suffering and their martyrdom even, it hangs in the balance. Despite the lip service that Trump and uh, his cronies have paid every year to Dr. King and will probably do tomorrow in some fashion, there's no escaping the plain facts that there's a concerted effort by them to undo the past 50 or 60 so years of civil rights and social justice work. There's a concerted effort to undo the advances in women's rights and LGBTQ rights in the rights of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. There's a concerted effort to deny people of religious traditions other than Christianity, especially Muslims, of their rights and atheists. They're still fighting to get atheists as chaplains into the military in some areas. Unitarian Universalists had a long fight to be recognized in the military. Remember what Dr. King wrote in that letter from a Birmingham jail. He said, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. And everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, he says, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. So I think I'm in good company when I make that comparison. The question we have to ask ourselves today is where we stand. I suspect that most, if not everybody here today showed where they stand when they mailed in when we mailed in our ballots or went to the polls in November and voted to get rid of Donald Trump and his corrupt administration. But it's plain to see that he's making that as difficult, as painful and as violent as possible. And even though it's only three days until he leaves, he can still wreak havoc on our nation. He's already begun by inciting those cult members to launch an insurrection. So the question and the challenge is again being put to us, will we stand idly by 
and wait and see what happens? Or will we do something? I believe that as people of religious faith, a liberal religious faith, we're being called again to stand up to these coming attacks that may happen. And frankly, I don't mean to instill fear, but this isn't going to go away quickly. We might not see these things personally. We might not feel any attacks ourselves personally. But the principle that Dr. King put forward when he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere still applies here more than ever. Each of us is being called to find out how we can best serve the cause of truth and justice. And when we find that, to do it to the best of our ability. Maybe that means direct action in a protest march, or maybe it means standing in, in a vigil. Maybe it's letter writing or making a phone call or an email to your representatives. Whatever it is you're called to do, we can't ignore it. You know, we've been hearing quite a lot of talk about healing our nation and unity, especially in the past week or so, right? It's the time for healing and unity. We've been hearing that especially from those who supported and enabled Mr. Trump for the past four years and after the election with his claims of election fraud. Odd how they're doing that now. And we've also heard it from the winning side, from President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris and their team. Personally, I think that Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris and their team are sincere in their calls for healing and unity. And I think they'll work to, uh, towards that. But I'm not convinced of that by any of Mr. Trump's enablers or his supporters. Their calls for healing and unity just seem like a desire to cover their own barrieres and to retain some measure of power without any accountability for their actions. So while all the talk about healing the nation after he's gone, that's all well and good. Let's not forget that healing does not happen without justice. The Hebrew prophet Micah had it in the right order. He says this, he says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, he says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act just to to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Those three in that order justice, mercy, humility. As Dr. King wrote, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And these are challenging and controversial times that we're living in. We have to ask ourselves where we stand. And so I think we all need encouragement. I wanna encourage you to stand with Dr. King and with Gandhi and with Bonhoeffer and with John Lewis and all those others who met the challenge of their faith. We sang that song, Faith of the Larger Liberty, and in there it refers to our Unitarian Universalist forebears. Some of them far back in history, like Michael Servetus and, and others, who died for their faith. Now, were they Unitarians in the same way that we're Unitarians today? No, but they are the forebears of our faith. They're the ones who got us to where we are today as Unitarians and Universalists. And I know that these are difficult and in many ways terrifying times. So what I'd like to do after the service is over is to just, while we have our chats, let's see if we can talk a little bit to each other about how we're doing and encourage each other to stand firm over the next few weeks, few months, few years. It's gonna be a long road, but we need each other more than ever now because we really don't know what's going to happen. This week is, is going to be the, the test. 
So please stay on Zoom after, your, after the service and share your thoughts if you'd like to, or just listen. May it be so. If you like this video, please like us on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click on the bell to be notified whenever we post a new video.